Today's January 2nd, 2019, and it's time for Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 469, and we have a special guest, Father Argo. Okay, I have a special guest. He's, are we allowed to give your location? You're in the Middle East. I don't know if I'm allowed to give your location or not. Uh, you can say Northern Iraq. Northern I Iraq. Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes, you did. He's in Northern Iraq. Uh, this is Father Argo, and he's given us reports uh, once or twice a year, sometimes three times a year, uh, from what I call Anglican Acts. Uh, people who are out in the field doing the, 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 the work of the church, the acts of the church. And uh, Father Argo has been doing this since your time at, in uh, south southern borders here of America when there was a big storm. And uh, that's when you and I first met. You've uh, been in other places over in uh, uh, Eastern Europe and uh, have served uh, quite well, in my humble opinion. And it's now time to get another update on uh, what's going on and uh, kind of this quasi-politics that may be affecting you with the uh, uh, president deciding to pull all the troops out of Syria. Um, that's going to, in my humble opinion, destabilize the area, allow Turkey to uh, beat up on the Kurds and uh, allow uh, everybody to beat up on the Kurds um, and affect your relations in uh, Iraq and Iran. So let's talk. What's going on? Um, yeah, that that decision came as a real shock. Um, I think to people in the Pentagon in Washington, actually, and to uh, certainly to uh, uh, the U.S. Kurdish friends here in the region, um, certainly has caused a, a considerable ripple. I, I think one thing to say at the start is that. Um, you know, the the U.S. should never have, have meddled in Syria in the first place. Um, you know, and, and the previous re regime in the U.S. needs to own this. Um, Eight million refugees, one million dead, because uh, the former president of the United States decided to bother um, Assad. And, of course, that drew in uh, Russia, and that drew in Iran, and it's just been an absolute disaster. And, and we can lay that squarely at the feet of the last administration. Problem we have now is situations uh, changed a bit. Uh, you know, as we say, if, if you don't like what's going on in the Middle East, wait five minutes, it'll get worse. So um, the, the big thing that uh, uh, Americans, Westerners need to understand right now is that, um, you know, ISIS is emerging, it's re-emerging. Uh, quite strongly, they're back up to thirty thousand uh, fighters with more sympathizers, and and the the ISIS narrative only works if they have uh, territory. They have to have land, otherwise the uh, it's not the final caliphate, and it doesn't work. They can't recruit. They you know, they can't get their money, and so what's happened now is Turkey is stepping in and is becoming the new caliphate, with Erdogan as the new caliph. Uh, Turkey, we've been saying this quietly to people for the past nine months. Um, the resurgence of ISIS is coming because of Turkey, NATO member. Turkey is funding them. Turkey is training them uh, in Syria. Uh, Turkey is uh, sending them abroad uh, to Asia for, for training and radicalization. So um, we have to understand that, that, that Turkey is the really the single greatest a threat now to the region. Um, funny enough that they're a, a NATO member, uh, but that's that's the situation of it. And the U.S. also agreed to sell them more than uh, three billion dollars worth of uh, high-tech uh, technology weapons. So the U.S. just gave the uh, Caliphate a uh, sophisticated missile system. The last time we spoke, um, if I remember correctly. Saudi Arabia was being the, the bully on the street. Is that still the situation? Uh, Saudi is actually sort of uh, uh, scared on the street right now. Uh, you know, they, they have their uh, continual you know, threat with uh, Iran and uh, their proxy war going on Yemen. But they're also scared of, uh, of Turkey. And... Uh, Again, this is Turkey on the rise. Turkey is uh, extremely aggressive, um, and it, it, it's telling people it's not that they're you know they they want Nineveh. 
uh, Mosul was an Ottoman capital. And it's not that they're going to take it back. They are taking it back uh, through their proxies. So all of the educational institutions in, um, in Mosul proper now have been taken over again by the Muslim Brotherhood. Erdogan, of course, in Turkey is full on, you know, this is public domain brotherhood guy. So uh, what, what's happening is that Turkey is, is making its move for all of Nineveh. It wants all of the Nineveh plans. It wants, uh, uh, it's going for the Yazidi territories up in the, in the west and northwest. So it, it's not that they're coming, they're here. They actually, I found out recently, Turkey has a full on military base in Bashika which is, uh, I just drove past there the other day. Um, that's, that's deep, deep, deep in Iraq. I mean, that's deep in the Nineveh Plains. And they have a very open military base there. So, you know, they bomb the Kurds regularly to the north. They're getting a bit more aggressive in their air campaign, uh, hitting Sinjar, the Yazidi home, uh, which is, of course, uh, they're sort of ruling out a, a solution of a return home for them because it's getting worse. Uh, so, so they're, uh, you know, regularly bombing all along northern Kurdistan. And the reality is, is they could take out Kurdistan in 12 hours. You know, well, the, the, news, the, the news here from President Trump is that uh, ISIS is on the run. It's been wiped out. Uh, there's just a few left. They're in the, the hills of northern Syria and fleeing. That's a total lie. I was okay. driving through... Uh, I uh, actually drove last week all the way to Mosul uh, through the Iranian checkpoints, uh, um, which was really fascinating. And um, in our car, we had uh, uh, capacity to listen to the local walkie-talkies, and it was ISIS talking the whole time all around us. So, yeah, the, the current inside numbers we have here on the ground from very good Iraqi sources is, again, back to, uh, to 30,000 fighters, uh, not only in Nineveh, but uh, uh, up in Sinjar and then uh, going out towards Kirkuk. Uh, so they're, they're resurgent, and it's Turkey who is bringing them back. Turkey, Turkey, the NATO partner, is funding and training them to bring them back, to use them as a proxy to destabilize the area and make their move for the Nineveh Plain, because, again, it was uh, an important part of the Ottoman Empire. And, and besides calling this the new caliphate they're just also they're also calling it the renewed ottoman empire so you have this wonderful thing going on right now of the uh renewed ottoman empire uh coming in one direction and the new persian empire coming in the opposite direction and the, the precisely where they clash is this pretend country called iraq <laughs> now there's <laughs> exactly in the last time we spoke there was incredibly large UN refugee camps uh, where you were serving. Are they still there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the big story was going to be, started to be that um, uh, before Trump's announcement, uh, things were really calming down. Um, you know, when, when the U.S. sort of uh, took the bounty off Assad's head, um, things, things calmed down. And so we have a, a quarter million refugees in a camp, you know, like, 35, 40 minutes from our house. And the talk was that uh, they would all, all the Syrian refugees here in our region would be going home in 2019. I mean, they were uh, really uh, economic. And then, uh, so accordingly, they cut off all the food aid to those quarter million refugees. And those are, you know, widows and orphans and elderly. Mm -hmm. So they have. No, the, the point was, you know, leave, go home, go back. But there was arguably a home to go back to. Um, and and a, a, the Kurdish press was even saying by the end of this year, they would all be home and gone. Now the sense on the street is that with uh, the U.S. withdrawal, um, things are going to be very bad. And we'll probably see another second great wave of refugees. So people, they were leaving, actually. They were going home. But we sense that they're going to return and, and even more are going to show up now in northern Iraq because of the um, uh, bloodbath that's about to happen in, uh, in Syria. Now, what you know about ISIS seems to be known within the army and military because once Trump made his announcement, lots of military in, the, in leadership resigned uh, and said, 
you know, we can't agree with what you're doing pulling out of Syria. When you see troops on the ground that are still there, they haven't pulled out yet, do they know what's going on with ISIS? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, if I know, then, you know, I would think the White House knows what I know. Right. <laughs> um, and I've certainly been very helpful trying to convey what I, I mean, this business of Turkey training ISIS and bringing them back. I mean, I, I got that to friends in Washington nine months ago. And then it was about, uh, when it was very hot intel and quiet, and it was just maybe two months ago that um, the Dutch uh, secret police uh, announced it publicly. Exactly mm -hmm. what I said. They made public that yes, Turkey is bringing back ISIS. So that's in the public domain now. So it's so not let's, a, it's a secret at all. Let's talk There's about no what normally happens in in politics. It, last time Syria made trouble, uh, we put Assad on the assassination list. Uh, are we going to put Aragon on the assassination list? Well, the the thing is, I think with Erdogan is well, one again. He, he's a full NATO partner. You know, and the U.S. president just sold him over three billion dollars of uh, uh, high-tech weaponry. So I'm not sure. You know, we go from uh, from that to assassination list very quickly. Uh, there just seems to be an incredible, uh, you know, denial that that Turkey is the new caliphate, that he is the caliph, and that uh, radical uh, Muslims globally, Sunnis, are looking to uh, Erdogan as the caliph and Turkey as the caliphate. Again, ISIS needs a narrative. It needs territory, and they've decided Turkey is that territory from which they can expand and, and build the final caliphate. So, uh, uh, yeah, fa just rather fascinating decision <laughs> that the U.S. Has made. No, it, uh, completely destabilized. Absolutely, positively, you know, terrified the Kurds. You know, the big media stories here the next day were. Damascus and um, Ankara waving their fingers at the Kurds saying, we told you so, don't trust the Americans, they can never be trusted, they're going to let you down, and then we're going to get you, and that's exactly what's happening. So, so Syria yeah, we, we is probably, we, we've yeah. let the Kurds down since the first Gulf War. Um, yeah, you know, yeah we, I don't know why we, they, I really, I have no, I, I really don't, I can't, I have no... It's just their only hope, sort of. But they did go scurrying to Moscow, um, which I've said they would do this week. So, um, you know, they're looking to Moscow. Uh, China is coming in here and talking as well. So, um, you know, the Kurds know they need a friend. And uh, the U.S. is uh, not reliable. Um, I'd say in our, you know, four and a half years here with ISIS that probably France and Holland have been their two uh, really strongest uh, you know, most loyal friends during this time. And, uh, friends, shame, but the, uh, the problem is when we our military is there, we have a presence that uh, other countries just can't provide. And we can provide, just by the imagery of our tanks and soldiers, a reason not to go and take out the Kurds. Without yeah. that, there's a vacuum. With that vacuum gone, um, what's going to happen to the Kurds in six months, a year from now? Uh, I mean, there's a really viable uh, thought floating around that Turkey, um, I mean, Turkey could just annihilate Kurdistan in uh, the number being put out militarily is 24 hours, but I'd say it's 12. I mean, they really just have three cities to, uh, you know, hit bang really hard and then cut all the major roads that connect them and then there's no more Kurdistan. So, uh, and I've heard Turkey has the plan, they're sitting on it, and they can move on it anytime they feel like it. So if they, uh, if they hit or build the hook in Sully and take out the roads in between them, uh, um, there is nothing left of Kurdistan. It's finished. And uh, that's, that's just very possible. Uh, that's, that's, that's somewhere between possible and likely. <laughs> and uh, uh, a bit of a scary thought. Uh, and I, I think really the, the only, if the U.S. was really committed to Kurdistan's defense, um, it would put up a, a no-fly zone immediately over Kurdistan. Now, because this could ha happen, you know, while we're talking. I mean, this is, Turkey mm -hmm. is more than capable and able and willing uh, to do that, to, to just demolish Kurdistan very, very quickly by the air, and then what's anybody going to do about it once it's happened? Uh, so if the U.S. does not get up um, a no-fly zone uh, in a air defensive shield uh, fairly quickly uh, we may not be around much longer okay 
So what is your recommendation then? I'm just checking the latest news from Turkey here. <laughs> Anything good? <laughs> no. I just, uh, yeah, duck. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, I think there's a sense that uh, it might be able to slow down uh, the U.S. withdrawal from Syria. Uh, be wonderful if some adults, you know, certainly the military might be able to uh, uh, walk that back a bit or at least slow it down. But, uh, you know, the, the big thing is we need to think about is, uh, is protecting, preserving Kurdistan. It's our best bet. Uh, again, Israel has just you know spoken up strongly for them, um, and so bringing uh, you know troop presence here, but certainly air cover is really the big big issue, and also uh, you know watch what's going to happen. The you know the South is already in revolt. The the, the Shia are are acting up you know down in Basra. They just assassinated uh, their leader. Um, your your cue your tell is when. Uh, so Iraq's there's no country called Iraq. It's just three things put together that don't belong together. That's and right. uh, it, it's you know it's like the Mississippi River. Water's going to end up going where it wants to go. Uh, and these three people groups don't want to be together. So you know I mean the reality is is they carve together a Shia majority south and a Sunni west and a Kurdish north. And you know this has been going on for a very long time. <laughs> it's not going to change. So I, I think we sort of have to some compare ten thousand years. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, that's a lot of that's a lot of grudges to get over. So there, uh, you know, it's going to crack. The fault lines are there. It's just really when. So watch for the uh, the continued ripple coming from the, uh, the the Shia down south, and then your signal will be when the Sunni really start acting up again in. Um, Nineveh out in the west and what I hear is uh, it's maybe coming sooner than later they're really starting to gear up and Turkey's egging them on so I'm hoping to go to uh, Mosul next week to scout around a little bit last week I got to go to the Iranian checkpoints drove through them with the Hashtashabi and introduced myself and that was very exciting and, wow. uh, and, and they yeah. let you go <laughs> well, you know this is the craziest thing it's because I was wearing a collar uh, with two priests in a collar, and I was told just to shut up, don't speak English. And what they said, you know, in Arabic was, "Oh, sorry, they, these guys are full on shabby. You know, they have the black skeleton masks, and you know, the weapons in our faces." And they're like, they see the collar, and they're, "Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, Father, sorry for delaying you. Please go ahead. Let's move cars out for you. Please forgive us." And it was the most surreal thing I've ever seen. So, yeah, the hostages, like they were pulling Arabs out of the car, throwing them on the roadside, banging people around, cannon guns pointed at cars, and the priests were allowed to go wherever we wanted. So uh, we, we went all day through hot Iranian checkpoints. And uh, so next week we're going to go see Mosul and uh, kind of get a feel for what's going on there. But it's just very, very unstable. You can just uh, you can feel it. Well, Mosul just started rebuilding, and now they're going to go through yeah. another, you know, conflict. Yeah, and this idiotic uh, U.S. bill giving $300 million to the uh, uh, Nineveh Plains. I mean, one uh, is that that money is going to end up in the hands of some very, very corrupt people on the ground. Uh, Iraq is the number one most corrupt country, you know, according to ratings in the world. So... Um, 300 will be pretty easy for them to pilfer. So don't expect that money to get to actual people on the ground. It won't. Uh, and it, that's going through Christian charities. And I promise you it won't get through those Christian charities to the people. Because uh, that's yeah. the way it works. The other thing is, as we said, is don't invest in Nineveh. Uh, we ourselves haven't because it's a fool's bet. It's a, it's a, a fool's errand. Uh, that, that is going to end up you know, back under control of something very bad. Uh, and I was just this afternoon in Tel Scuff, which is a, a village just hammered by ISIS, I mean, destroyed. And then uh, we're getting ready to go over to Batnaya, which is even worse. I mean, it's just complete rubble. And uh, the, but the people here who have told, have told us that just said, you know, something worse than ISIS, we're not interested. Something worse than ISIS is going to replace it. You know, don't worry. 
And uh, it's actually happened quite quickly with Hashtashabi. And then ISIS is circling right back again and, and regrowing, rebuilding. So, I, you know, this $300 million the U.S. has put into Nineveh, again, one, it's just going to end up in Swiss bank accounts. And number two is, um, uh, you know, if they actually did projects on the ground, they're going to lose it. It's, it, it's going to go back to the bad side and pretty quickly with that. So our audience is going to want to be able to help you. How can they help Father Argo uh, in Iraq, Syria uh, with your ministry? <laughs> right now, we're, we're actually starting to try and transition in between wars from relief to uh, recovery, but it's very cold right now. Uh, we're working in uh, one camp. We have uh, hundreds and hundreds of orphans and widows from uh, their Yazidi from ISIS. Uh, no winter coats, no winter shoes. It's very inexpensive here. So, you know, $30 buys a blanket coat and shoes for our kiddo. And we're just uh, scrambling those out as fast as we can. It's really cold. They, they're going on four and a half years in those tents. Uh, a food basket for a widow is $30 a month. Again, they've cut off all food aid for the Syrian refugees. So we are in those camps uh, sharing the love of Christ with them, and I, and I do believe that is the gospel itself, but they also, uh, it opens conversations, and we can pretty quickly get them into uh, Bible study groups to answer their question, why are you here, what, this, what is this all about? Uh, it happens uh, pretty naturally and, and actually quite easily. So we're seeing some really good, good kingdom momentum going on. This is the generation of kingdom momentum uh, in the world of Islam. I've mm -hmm. talked to people who were former uh, Muslims who've come to Christ who are from the Middle East, uh, mm -hmm. who've had visions of Jesus. Uh, and your work is on that cutting edge. Uh, tell me some of the testimonies. I uh, just had one the other day. Uh, was one of our what we call a super producer. So he's one of the religious minorities here, and he uh, uh, in camp and just came back. And said I met a woman, and she had this vision of a man in white, and he came to her and just said, "Follow me, follow me, follow me." And so she wanted to know who this man was because she wants to follow him. Uh, it, was, it was so compelling. So I've been training him to teach her Discovery Bible Study, and they're exploring together who this is. We had one just like it you know, the other day. So 30% of Muslims who come in the kingdom come from a dream or vision of Jesus. That makes our work really easy. So pray for more of those. I mean, you can't mess yes. it up, really. No. <laughs> uh, but we're also seeing it now, the dreams and visions among the Yazidi people also. Um, and we're doing sort of the first early engagement with them. They're not Muslim. They're not Christian. They're Yazidi. Um, and there, we're starting to see an outbreak of dreams and visions there. And then, like, the really good news is um, the latest count for uh, certified disciple-making movements globally. Uh, a, a, a certified movement is where we see 100 church plants multiply five times over a five-year period. This can involve millions of people. We have about 650 of these globally counted right now. Uh, 2,200 being counted, and 30% of those are in the Islamic world right now. I mean, it's God's, it's God's time. So it's not just India and China. It is the Middle East. It is God's time, and we're seeing it. We're starting to hit on super sharers, super producers, so that, you know, again, the mercy ministries help us uh, get in and get access and get into their lives, and, and that is the gospel. Uh, you know, bringing medicine and health care and education and orphan care and trauma care, but it also uh, opens the door for spiritual conversations, and then we can quickly get them into uh, Bible study groups, and uh, off they go. So it's uh, it's a great time. Uh, it's All just, right, probably so have another major war here. So yeah, <sighs> just. God can use evil for good. I keep telling myself that, but uh, uh, it, it's it's hard to watch. You know, you know Nineveh had its chance back in the time of Jonah, but uh, I just uh, yeah. Well, we were at Nahum's tomb today, actually. You know, Nahum came after Jonah. They were they were good for a little bit after Jonah, and then got bad again. So you know, Nahum said they'd be wiped out. So we we did see Nahum this afternoon and checked in on him. 
But, uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, we have a major war about every 18 months here, so you, you really can't do too much um, you know, infrastructure, but you have to sprint hard and fast when you get windows. And so we're sprinting hard and fast right now. There's a big window, but we got to hit it. Well, even if you go back to the Iran, there's nobody under 45 years old that has not seen a war every three years. If mm -hmm. you if you really think about it, that's it's an amazing statistic, and uh, certainly want to keep this nation and this region in our prayers. Want to keep uh, Father Argo and his ministry in our prayers. I'm putting up right now the link to uh, the website, so you can go and uh, make donations to uh, keep the people warm, including Father Argo. You're sitting there in the cold. What's where's your heater? Uh, the heater's not working, so we're walking around in blankets and coats and. It's, uh, I mean, it's really cold, but we just remind ourselves that all of our friends are in tents. So, you know, we can come home to the cold house at night, and that's better than a wet, cold tent. So, but yeah, and it's urgent. So we're, we're just scrambling right now. We, we tried to get out to a camp uh, yesterday, but it was a blizzard. We had 800 kids waiting for us for winter clothes. Couldn't get to them. So we turned around, went to the Syrian border, which is very neglected and hit uh, Christian Yazidi uh, refugee villages all along the Tigris River. And uh, we'll try to get back up in the mountains. But we're just uh, full, tilt, full tilt with uh, blankets and coats, shoes and socks right now. Keep them from freezing. You know, the summers are miserable here, but they get through them. But, but the people, the refugees, uh, fear winter. And they really, people die in winter. And we have 2 million uh, refugees within 45 minutes of our house. And God is very moving. sobering. And it's very sobering. Yeah, and God's moving. Yeah. So do keep so uh, Father your Argo in your prayers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it, it is amazing that uh, in today's world that you and I can communicate face to face uh, through technology and, and record the testimonies going on uh, in those camps. And I, I certainly appreciate your time, and uh, you know, I, you get your staying up a little late, so we appreciate that as well. Um, go to his website, uh, please donate. This is where it's happening. These are the Anglican Acts, um, and uh, you can't do anything but pray. Uh, participate and give and we really thank you for that you've been watching anglican unscripted episode 469 i'm kevin Carlson, and i'm father argo 